Hello and welcome to the Science of Reading Leadership Podcast. We are so excited. We are on site here at AASA 2024, and I have Dr. Tiffany Brunson here with me. She is a superintendent, and let's hear more about her and her leadership journey and her reading journey. Tell us more about you and your district. Hi, how are you? So I am Tiff- Dr. Tiffany yep. Brunson, and I'm the proud superintendent of Elementary School District 159. Okay. And we are located about 30 miles south of Chicago. Um, we serve the communities of Matheson, Richton Park, okay, as well as Tinley Park, Illinois. We have about 1,600 students, and we have five schools pre-K through eight. Okay, that was my question, is if if an elementary district, because I know Illinois has elementary and high school districts. We do, we do. And so you only have pre-K through eighth graders. Pre-K, yes, that is correct. Excellent. So we are really talking about today, not just science of reading and teaching it, right? We really want to know about people in your role or maybe assistant superintendents and directors, the process of leading the science of reading. So tell us where your school is or your district is in that journey. Okay, so one of the there there's two things that I always tell people that I don't think that people take um, stock of that they really really should is thinking about your human resource, okay, as well as your uh, financial or fiscal resources, but also thinking about your uh, curriculum that you're using. And so I always tell people you should make sure that your district is a data rich, but not a data saturated, because sometimes you can get uh, analysis by paralysis, right. paralysis by, yep. <laughs> <laughs> by analysis, too much data. Yep. And so what we really did is we took the time to think about our human resource. Like, who do we have? Um, And so this is my second year here as the superintendent. Um, And so what we took the time, my teacher learning accountability team, very small but mighty team. And we looked at the people that we have, our human resource, our interventionists, um, the people who serve our students who are furthest from success, and as well as who is teaching in our primary grades. um, And in the middle school, Who's teaching our ELA? Right. Right. And so are they in the position for them to be successful? Are they the ones that should be teaching those um, classes? How long have they been teaching those classes? And so all of those things we have um, taken into account. And so in looking at our curriculum, we want to make sure that we were using the best. Yep. But also making sure that we were filling in the gaps for anemic awareness. Sure as well as making sure that everything that we were doing was intentional. And sometimes, you you know, people choose even consultants that come to your, your district. Are they the right consultants right. that you should be working with? And are they fitting all of the pieces that are important to you and not bringing in extra things? That... <laughs> or, or giving you something that is... Um, a canned yep. program yep. because this is where a lot of districts uh, go wrong is really thinking about what do, what does my student population need? And so do like for my population, we have a large amount of students that are um, ESL. Yep. And so really thinking about what are we providing that particular subgroup of students, which is different than the, um, the other students that we have. And so we, are now doing things like classroom walkthroughs. We are looking at um, the use of our curriculum and making sure that the teachers have some say in what this actually looks like and what it feels like and that students understand that they are supposed to be passive. Uh huh. <laughs> They're supposed to be active learners. Yes, yes. Because oftentimes we're doing things and students don't, e- they don't even understand why we're doing the things that we're doing. And so we took all of these things into account. And again, you inspect what you expect. And we spent a lot of times in our classes watching and providing feedback to our teachers. Um, And we have seen tremendous growth. So this is I'm not trying to sell any particular programs because I to me, I believe that if you do take stock of your curriculum, of right. course, it's important, but it, it's the people important, behind it are really important. The, and people, the processes. <laughs> that's right. The process um, that you use, the processes that you use, as well as most importantly, your human resources. Those are the resources that are most important. And also getting teachers to trust that what you're asking them to do, that they feel like they have the tools and they feel 
that they they have the uh, ability to right. do it. That was my next question for you was you said that you got a lot of feedback from teachers. You were giving a lot of feedback to teachers. What I want to know is what did it look like to glean the feedback from the teachers who are actually implementing the new materials? Um, was that surveys? Was that conversations? Did you have ad hoc groups? Um, and what was their feedback? It was a little bit of all of that. So there were some surveys, but it was like listening sessions, being able to understand where their apprehensions would be or and you know teachers are <laughs> easy they will tell you oh something new oh oh that just wait it out it'll, it'll go away because sometimes they can be very cynical and I don't think it's um something nefarious I just think that we have not been great at utilizing things and giving it time we don't give things enough time because we want to hurry up and and see some results. So we were very intentional. Um, we listened to the teachers. We wanted to give them safe a safe space, you know, for that inter those intervals of instruction, and make sure that we gave meaningful feedback. It was not evaluative. Oh, okay. And it was not um, scary. Yep. We wanted to make sure that they understand that this was that we wanted them to have a learner's stance. Okay. And it it has been very, very beneficial. We have seen our mid-year data. We have seen improvements in at every grade level in every school. Wow. One of the things that we also implemented is that we wanted our teachers to disaggregate their data yeah. by hand. Yes. I think that there's something to be said for that. <laughs> yes. And remember that data points have little faces and heartbeats. And so really understanding that if we are doing this right, all, having all of our students be literate <laughs> provides them with access and opportunities that they, you know, that they would otherwise be shut yes, out. Of. Absolutely. I and love so they did everything by hand. Now, some were not very happy about that because it is very time consuming. However, it helped them understand who were the students that were furthest from success and how they were doing. And when I say every single grade level at, in every single school made growth. And we're so proud of that. This episode is brought to you by Just Right Reader. A critical component of a high quality explicit phonics program is applying developing phonics skills in real connected text. Decodables give children opportunities to read successfully and independently from the moment they begin learning phonics. For beginning readers, experiencing the joy of reading success is highly motivating and accelerates achievement. To learn more, visit JustWriteReader.com. I love the quote that every single data point has a face and a heartbeat. <laughs> Absolutely. Because sometimes we could dehumanize the work. You yep. know, it's like, let's, let's, here's, my, here's improve, my red kids. Right, here's let, my yellow. Oh, yeah. Red, green <laughs> yep. kids. No, no. Who are those children? Yep. And then really think about it. If they're having, and I know this isn't really about the science of reading, this is about looking at kids holistically. That's, that's and still a part of it. It is still a part of yep. it. And we oftentimes and, and it's a lot of pressure as a superintendent because, you know, you're 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 hired <laughs> to improve test scores. But I like to remind people that I'm improving students lives and access. And that's really what it's all about, <laughs> because that's really what it's all about. And that's so, our end goal. yes, that's the end goal. So I think that when you approach it like that and you bring down their defenses, then people actually say, oh, yeah, I, I definitely want to improve their lives and their access and opportunities. And I said, OK, now let's talk about reading. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I'm telling you, it's it's been a, it, it's been amazing to see the growth and then for the teachers to feel as though that they they can do it. Yeah. Because I, I think they were in a rut of thinking and always being told what they weren't doing right. So they need to praise and they need to encouragement. And I'm telling you, we are rocking it out. That it. feels good. You mentioned, you know, you've kind of gone, at, I guess, your work with leading the science of reading and probably a lot of your other, you know, strategic planning work and um your goals through the th lens of resources, essentially your human resources, your materials and your financial resources. Is there any other? I just love that it's so like practical, pragmatic, foundational. It's not anything that's like, oh, nobody's ever heard of this, um, but you're just being really consistent with it. Is there any other 
like practical thing that you feel like you're doing that maybe another superintendent or assistant superintendent might be overlooking? Well, I will tell you this. This has made the biggest, I would say, when looking at your human resource. So we have our team, our TLA team, they actually go into classrooms and they will model lessons. They will co-teach. We're really, really boots on the ground. Okay. That is, that right there is the difference. Because, you know, from your office or from the district, you don't want to say, this is what we have to do. And then you give a PD and then say, go off and do it. No, ours are, it's really ongoing. It's hands-on and not hands-on in an evalu- right, evaluative right. way. I have to c- continue to repeat that part. But it's it's in a, um, we're learning together, we're growing right. together kind of way. And it has really brought the teacher's defenses down and you know we'll send out a survey and say well who who would like a Uh one-on-one coaching you know session and we had all these teachers you had volunteers teachers (laughs) and we were like okay that's a sign of success yes that's a sign of trust so they're yes the relational (laughs) trust yeah and so this this my story is really not just about the technical aspects of teaching reading it is really about even just the um, adaptive yes, part, yes, you know that's and but making, that's what this is all about. Is yes. that because your role as a superintendent or a district leader is typically not like you said the technical pieces of science of reading, of knowing the vowel teams and knowing the syllables, Correct. right? Not that it's not helpful to know those Correct. things. However, that's really not what leading it is all about. No, so no, and it's also giving people time and the space to even fail. Yeah. Oh. Because most times that's not what we allow. And adults don't want to fail. No, no. But if you say, oh, can you try this? Like, let us know how it went. And then we do take the feedback and then we make the changes to the PD, um, how it's delivered, how often is it delivered. And because people make the mistake of, you know, you have it on your calendar. You have a beginning of the school year PD. Then you have the PDs that are spread throughout the year. We do something every month. And some of them are volunteer. Okay. Some of them are voluntold. <laughs> That's the world <laughs> you know? we live in. <laughs> and then some are, we're, you know, we're just meeting with the primary teachers. Okay. Sometimes we're just meeting with the middle school Trying teachers. Trying to be a little bit more differentiated, too. Yes. And so yep. because you have people sitting in a, a PD and saying, this has there's, nothing to do with me. There's literally nothing worse than being, you know, a specials teacher and you're... Absolutely. organizing math standards <laughs> and you're like i teach yes yeah. i don't teach that yeah you know <laughs> so we have just really been intentional about the differentiation the amount of time that we spend um when we go in the classroom what we are looking we have these walkthrough tools which is and we look at the data builds trust <laughs> everything is transparent and we give the information to the teachers we say um this you you know, we, it depends on the teacher. They're not utilizing the curriculum. Oh, OK. So then we we monitor that. And then we're able to come into the classroom and say, we need you to increase the What's usage. Going on? Yep. You know, is there a barrier to that? Do you need a one on one time or another training or what do you need? And so we really have been um, intentional about support. Okay, I feel like I could talk to you all day and we could probably do a part two. I have two more questions, so I'm going to try to whittle my questions down. Okay. So my next one is about how you've talked a lot about training teachers and the professional development and the coaching. What about your building administrators? How has PD and training and coaching changed for them? Yes. So we have worked really hard to improve their and sharpen their lens because as I was a I was a high school administrator, middle school administrator, and elementary school oh, administrator. Wow. All, that's a, all that's great. That's a great <laughs> all yeah, great. experience to have. And of course, all of those are different, yes, right? Yes, yes. And so what we have done is to make sure, because the worst thing to do is be a new superintendent coming in and people feeling like you're changing everything mm-hmm. or you don't, you know, sure. you don't trust that they have these particular skills. Right. So what we've been doing is fine tuning and building upon what they do know but also creating the space for them to be vulnerable and say that they don't understand. And so really it's been a lot of coaching around their critical lens. Like when you go in the classroom, these are the things that you should see. 
it's not just a walk through, high five some kids and walk out. You, because, I, yeah, you need I to be able to give that feedback. It's so important, too, when you think about the, you know, just the educational era that probably a lot of our principals were trained in if the, yes. when they were teachers, yes. that instruction might look different and that to create the place that they can be vulnerable to admit this isn't how I taught reading. It wasn't how I was taught to teach reading. <laughs> correct. Correct. Yeah. And, yeah. And so in our in our principal meetings, we also ask them to bring artifacts and we also ask them to talk about their experience. Yep. So you went to your your instructional leadership team meeting and you ta- you looked at your data. How did it go? Um, we also have been in now we're employing Mikasa Sukasa. So now we have them going in to watch their their oh colleagues run their meetings. So the middle school principal will go to a second grade, yes. you know, PLC and because those are going to be your students and that right there is having them not work in silos. Yeah. Now they're becoming friends. Yes. Or understanding as colleagues. Yes. You know, as our, our students matriculate through our school district, everyone's going to end up in a middle school. Yep. So the middle school principal you, needs to go see what is happening yep. in kindergarten and the kindergarten teachers to say those are future eighth graders. So what we're doing is making sure that our principals are going into the, the elementary schools and vice versa and also watching their colleagues lead a, yes. a data meeting yes. and then coming back and 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 stealing a few things yes. right like well and just know? building a culture of camaraderie and collaboration Correct. rather than competition of we all want all of our schools to grow perfectly <laughs> said because we are growing as a district yeah it isn't a competition yeah and that is really really important because if one if it, fail we all fail yes yes absolutely okay so our very last question that we always ask on the pod is you have a lot on your plate as a superintendent you have a so many stakeholders you answer to so many (laughs) initiatives and legislation and policies, right. That you, that you're in charge of, but let's say you could only give one piece of advice, one next step for another superintendent in terms of accelerating their reading achievement, one step that they should take that would give them the most bang for their buck. To give them the most bang for their buck is to include everyone. There you go. Include everyone's voice. There shouldn't be this secret team of people going off and making the decisions for those who are most affected by those decisions. So you have to have equity of voice and include everyone in order for everyone to thrive. You you need everyone's perspective. It's brilliant. And so. and so important. Well, thank you so much for thank being you. here. We had do- Dr. Tiffany Brunson. Thank you for listening today on Science of Reading Leadership Podcast. Until next time. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. If you found this conversation valuable, please subscribe and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We will see you next time on Science of Reading Leadership, Guiding Minds, Transforming Lives.